All right, hi everyone. Um, I'm Emily Belaine from Point Reyes Books and welcome to our event tonight with uh, Amy Nazuka Matato and Elena Passarello. Uh, we're so excited to have them here. This is Amy's last event of the year that she's kindly agreed to do with us uh, and we're, we're looking forward to it. Um, we'll get right to them in a little bit. Before we do, I just wanna let everyone know about a few upcoming events we have. Um, this Monday at noon, Catherine May is going to be joining us from the UK to discuss her new book, Wintering, The Power of Rest and Retreat in Difficult Times with Marley Grace. And then next Thursday, that one is going to be at noon, and then next Thursday, December 10th at 7 p.m., uh, Ken Lane, creator of Desert Oracle, will be joining us from Joshua Tree to discuss the hidden histories of the Mojave. Uh, and then another one that we're very excited about is on Monday, December 14th at 7 p.m. Elliot Weinberger, uh, who's been called one of the world's greatest essayists by the New York Times, will be joining conversation with Pulitzer Prize winner Forrest Gander uh, to discuss Elliot's new book, Angels and Saints. And uh, all these events are on our Crowdcast page and you can subscribe to our Crowdcast page if you don't wanna miss anything. Um, but tonight, as I mentioned, uh, we're joined by poet and essayist Amy Nazuka Matatil and Elena Passarello to talk about Amy's new book, World of Wonders, in praise of fireflies, whale sharks, and other astonishments, published by Milkweed Editions. Um, and like I said, we're so excited to be here. Um, I think both Stephen from Point Reyes and I heard Amy speak at our annual book selling conference in January, which feels like last January, which feels like a world away. <laughs> but it's nice to be uh, finishing the year out with a familiar face. Uh, so before I turn it over to Amy and Elena, let me just tell you a little more about them. Uh, Elena Passarello is the author of two essay collections, the most recent of which Animals Strike Curious Poses, was named a notable book of 2018 by the New York Times, The Guardian, Publishers Weekly, and other publications. Uh, her essays on pop culture and the natural world have recently appeared in National Geographic, Paris Review, American Science and Nature Writing. Uh, you can hear her on the radio every week as the co-host of Public Radio International's art and culture program, Livewire. Amy Nazuka Matatel is the author of four collections of poems, including most recently Oceanic, winner of the Mississippi Institute of Arts and Letters Award. Uh, other awards for her writing include fellowships and grants from the National Endowment for the Arts, Mississippi Arts Council, and McDowell. Her writing has appeared in Poetry, The New York Times Magazine, ESPN, and Tin House. She serves as poetry faculty for the writing workshops in Greece and as a professor of English and creative writing in the University of Mississippi's MFA program. Uh, and if you haven't already, this little green buy the book button at the bottom of the screen is where you can pick up World of Wonders. Uh, and Amy has very graciously agreed that anyone, for one person who buys uh, World of Wonders tonight, she is personally gonna buy you a copy of Animal Strike Curious Poses. So that will be, We'll randomly select one person <laughs> who buys World of Wonders tonight before midnight uh, Pacific time uh, to get a copy of that. So I don't know what you're waiting for, but you should buy the book now. Uh, but let me turn it over to these two wonderful writers and uh, welcome Amy and Alina. Yay, thank you so much, Emily. Alina, so great to see you. Hello, Amy, how's it going? Going good. I feel, I mean, I think it's been years since we've seen each other in person. Yeah, I can't remember. I drove past you uh, and waved this summer or last summer. Uh, I, I was driving yeah. from Memphis to Tupelo and yeah. I saw the sign for Oxford and I waved. <laughs> I believe you were like 45 minutes away from me. I can't, and I was not there. Was it last summer? I can't remember. Or last summer. Summer of 2019, which I'm still, I still think of it as last summer because this summer was just today. Yeah, exactly. Yo, no, no, no. Yeah, no. I was, I was not even in the country. I was in Greece, and I was like, of all. And usually, I'm just in Mississippi, except for that those two weeks, and it just happened to be that time. But well, yeah, now we get to be here. We get yeah. to be virtually together. <laughs> exactly. exactly. Um, oh, you know what? I forgot to get something. I think. You forgot something as well. 
I think I did. I think we might have a little bit of a costume change. So everybody hold on, we'll be right back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. A beaver, and this is I stole my son's jellyfish costume. Do you see it lights up on top? Did you um, make that for him? I did, I did. And you know, I went all out because I had a hunch and I was right. Can you guys see this light? Yes. This was the last time he wanted to go trick-or-treating. So I went all like I started this baby in September. And just every night, it'd be a new tentacle or a new, you know. <laughs> um, so obviously, I knew that fast forward, we'd be in a pandemic, and I would be wanting to, you know, wear this with the only person I can think of who would be willing to wear a beaver hat with me. So, <laughs> well, you know what the good thing is about wearing it on this reading, Amy, is now you can write it off on your taxes. All the fabric <laughs> and LED lights, and you know, this is this is officially a deductible document. <laughs> No, I should have saved all the receipts of this tool and this um, this ribbon. Anyway, gosh, why did I do this all fall? I should have just been like, <laughs> it'd be normal. Why, why not? I am writing a book called World of Wonders after all. So, And I'm so excited to talk with you about it. Uh, let's dive right in because one of the things that I know Amy wants to make sure we can do is have a good ample space of time to chat with y'all. So please be thinking about your questions um, as we have our little conversation. And when you're ready, write them in the chat bar and um, we will make sure that we have at least 10, probably more like 15 minutes to do Q&A at the very end. Awesome. And we have one more uh, little challenge for mm -hmm. our audience. Um, this is Amy's idea. Amy's going to do another book giveaway of some rag called Animal Strike Curious Poses to uh, a haiku. Uh, if anybody would like to write a haiku, a, f a line of five syllables, a line of seven syllables, and a line of five syllables about any of the animals in the table of contents of her book, um, you can, you know, just tune us out while we're talking about whatever the hell we're talking about and write your little haiku and then submit it at the very, very end after the Q&A. So hold on to it until then and you'll be, uh, I don't know exactly what the adjudication process is there, <laughs> Ms. Nezuku but um, yeah, I think we're just going to, something that surprises us, something that surprises us at the end. That's all I'm looking for in poems right now. Great. It's a pandemic, so, you know, I'll be very, very generous. Um, but you know what? Oh, this thing, the, the table of, or, um, I'm trying to post the table of contents in here, and Crowdcast says it's too big. Okay. So, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, how do I do this? Let me see. I will, I will write them down one by one while you give your reading. How's that? Sure? Okay. Yeah. Do you have, you have my book right there in front of you? Gosh, I, I have. Oh, there you go. All right, you're the best. You're the best. It's like a strange public access cable show in like. <laughs> no, it's totally normal. Again, like just I'm <laughs> speaking to a beaver, and the beaver talking to a jellyfish. Like we're BFFs, <laughs> and you know this should be just this should be every Zoom. My goodness, take this on the road in January. On the road from our living rooms. Yeah, that's right. Well, um, so Amy, um, I personally requested because I have the audio book as well as the hard copy of this. And I think I have a galley too, but I personally requested just a little five minute reading to kick us off because you do a wonderful job presenting this book. Um, oh, and I just, I I will, up. Hang on one second. Like I've never had to deal with this before. I think I have like glue bits still coming through. And ten, okay, sorry. The tentacle, I couldn't see. I was like, something was in front of my eye. Okay. We need to take a costume break. We can always just keep yeah. imagining. Oh, hell no. I'm reading with this thing on my head. I'm going to get a screenshot. Uh. <laughs> okay. So. so I'm going to read the axolotl as requested by you. Yay! And I'm so sorry. I wish I, um, I hate that you're doing this like while I'm reading, um, but I will. Uh, so you have the audiobook too? I have, I have three different versions. I have a 
a PDF, a hard copy, and an audio copy. Oh my gosh, good grief. Well, no, that's not good for you. They wanna make sure that you are prepared. Um, thank you so, so much. Um, all right, so I'm not gonna read all of Axolotl, but I do, I'd be remiss. So um, one thing that I've learned is to not go into these events assuming everybody knows my book. And so there, there'd be like early on in August, there'd be times I would just launch right in and then there'd be these sweet little old ladies who would follow me from reading to reading and they'd be like, excuse me, we still don't understand what your book is. <laughs> and I, so I wanna just say that this is um, a collection of 30 very short essays about my favorite plants and animals, um, but they are deliciously illustrated, Meant not all, but many of them have these great little illustrations by a wonderful artist named Fumi Nakamura. And it was super important to me to have an Asian American um, illustrator for this, and she just knocked it out of the ballpark. I mean, uh, I want every one of these for a t-shirt, you know, um, and, and really she just, I asked Milkweed to help me find somebody that um, could do like 98% biologically realistic and then 2% whimsy. But once I said whimsy, then people were putting eyeballs on like the corpse flower or, you know, like anime kind of style um, birds. And I was like, no, 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 they still need to be accurate, you know? And she, Fumi was the exact, she was just amazing. So. Anyway, so I'm gonna read a little bit of Axolotl and then we will chat. And meanwhile, I'm, I'm dead serious. So Elena, I see put um, in the comments there, the table of contents. So I all I want a winner for this book, you're not gonna to wanna to miss out on this. It's a haiku. Remember those of you who don't know, I also don't wanna assume people know what this is. It's a three line poem, five syllables, seven syllables, and then it ends with five syllables about any of these animals or plants. And before we go, I, we're just gonna pick one. So when you are done with them, go ahead and type in your haiku in the in the comments. And it's just gonna be whichever one we think is best. You know, there's no, we're in a pandemic here, folks. So there's no, um, there's no uh, roadmap for this. We're just gonna, we're gonna figure out the one that surprises and delights us the most. Um, all right. The axolotl, Abistoma mexicanum. And I'm just gonna read um, maybe the last part of this, of this, of this uh, essay. And ax, I feel we're like moving, instead of my hair, I'm moving the tentacles off of my face. <laughs> it's hard now, like you asked me to read a serious part and now I'm gonna be giggling through this whole thing. An axolotl can help you smile as an adult, even if someone on your tenure committee puts his palms together as if in prayer every time he sees you off campus and does a quick short namaste. Every time you see him, every time you see him, even though you've already told him several times that you don't you act, that you actually attend a Methodist church. But, to, but it's as if he doesn't hear you or he does and doesn't care, chuckling to himself as he shuffles across the icy parking lot, hands jammed into his pockets. Wide and thin, the axolotl smile runs from one end of the amphibian's face to the other, curving at each end ever so gently upward. Perhaps second in distinctiveness only to the axolotl's smile are the external gills on stalks that fan across the back of its head, three on each side, like an extravagant crown of fuchsia feathers radiating from its neck. The average axolotl grows to be just over a foot long and dines on all manner of worms, blood, earth, and wax. It also fancies insect larvae, crustaceans, and even small fish if it can find some. Here's the thing, scientists have taken to studying axolotls for its regenerative, regenerative properties of their, of, its, of their limbs. They're unique in the animal world because axolotls don't seem to ever develop scar tissue to hide damage from a wound. Axolotls can even rebuild a broken jaw. In recent experiments, scientists have crushed their spinal cords and even that regenerates. Scientific American reports that you can cut the axolotl's limb off at any point, wrist, elbow, upper arm, and it will make another. One can cut off various parts of arms and legs a hundred times, and every time 
the smile and a bloom of arm spring forth like a new perennial. Just when one thinks nothing can grow back after such a winter, the tiny pale shoots of a crocus burst through the sloppy, mulch-thin ground after a difficult and heavy sugar snow. An impossible wound begs to differ with its body and says, I've got another and another. These tests involve the repeated amputation of limbs over a hundred times. What does the lab technician say after the 95th day, perhaps, of this kind of work? Just five more to go and we'll close up the report. <laughs> How does that person come home and forget those hundreds of estranged arms and legs? It's hard to remember axolotls are endangered when you see their bodies regenerate parts so quickly when they smile at you in aquariums, their pink gills waving as they study you and your own fixed mouth. Particularly devastating about these amphibians is the fact that people who created the International Union for the Conservation of Nature have determined there are no more axolotls in the wild. None. Wild axolotls used to swim in abundance in two particular lakes in Mexico, but there haven't been any documented cases of finding wild axolotls since 2013. One of the lakes was drained as a result of the growth of human population, growth in Mexico City, and the other is recently overrun with carp, which gobble up axolotl legs like M&Ms. Axolotls are now found in aquariums and fish supply stores to be sold only as pets. In spite of the axolotl's seemingly serene visage that often tricks people into thinking of cuteness and perhaps a gentle restraint, axolotls are pretty enthusiastic, sometimes even cannibalistic, in their eating habits. But nature has a way of giving us a heads up to stand back and admire them at a distance or behind glass. An axolotl's forelegs don't just end with sweet millennial pink stars. They are claws designed to help the axolotl eat meat. And when it eats, man, what a wild mess. When it gathers a tangle of blood worms into its mouth, you will understand how a galaxy first learns to spin in the dark and how it begins to grow and grow. Yes, 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 yes. Thank you, thank you. So it's kind of such a little depressing um, moment there when you think of like all those kind of cut off arms and legs and you know, especially the pink ones, I'm biased, but the little pink arms and legs, just like inches of them, like little doll doll arms and legs. And <laughs> whew, anyway, but yeah, that's, that's a snippet of the axolotl. Um, I'm so the reason that I requested that, and thank you for taking my request, is because it that essay does something that happens several times in the books that I really um, it can't even be described in a sentence because I think it's really multi-directional. There's a lot of different things happening at once. I'm learning these things about the axolotl that I never knew. Oh, and that's huge because I consider you to be like animal expert in so many ways, you know. So oh. that greatest well but that's i know you read so much and so that's a huge huge compliment like um, oh yeah well i mean that's the a joy of the book is to learn those things but there's also a kind of a philosophy right that is sort of attached and then you didn't read this part but there's a parallel personal story in a lot of these and i, I believe the axolotl one involves kind of being told by a white girl in middle school that your skin tone can't support some kind of lip gloss. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just anything like the color red at all, you know? And it's funny, like I don't, it's a little fading now, but that's all I wear now is red. <laughs> um, and every, you know, and there, I'd be lying to say I don't like, there's a small teeny part that remembers that all the time. And now I just relish it with the glee, you know? Um, yeah, totally. Yeah, so, so yeah, my friends have come to know it was actually my friends who kind of gave me the idea of this of this connection because they know they've seen it before either you know when i'm in the, uh, sometimes maybe sometimes at a reading or you know wherever where uh, I don't know, someone, like you say my name so beautifully, but there's times where like say for example, someone butchers my name and I'll just I'll be sitting there with like a very tight tight lip smile and you know my my husband my friends know oh Amy's got the axolotl smile on you know like I try like 
you know, some people have resting bitch face. I have resting exalamal face just from a history of that, you know, um, a history of having to, you know, to do it to kind of survive, you know, in some ways. Um, I think that that's, there's a connection to the way that humans interact with animals that's very present and the fact that you recognize that. Mm. Because I think one of the reasons that we love the axolotl is because it it has this human smile, right? I think about the Samoyed dog that everybody mm. loves because they have this Samoyed smile, but in actuality, mm. it's not a smile. It just is a, it's a, a physical characteristic mm. that looks like this human expression. Mm. And, we deny the biology that's beneath the axolotl to privilege our own, which is exactly what happens, I think, when you get the, the <laughs> Nezuku Matatsil smile, right? <laughs> we need to understand that animals are operating on their own terms and not just on the superficial terms with which we observe them. Yeah, yeah. And to my detriment, you know, when that smile comes on, it's a way of protecting myself too, but it's also a way to kind of, you know, tell whatever you know racist or person who's just like um making some obnoxious comment it's okay i'm making you feel okay you know what i mean and and like a, it's a comforting them like i don't want to make you feel uh like you're you know you don't know what you're talking about so i'm just going to make you feel comfortable and and to my detriment they see me smiling mm -hmm. i think it's okay so um yeah but you know had i had i started on the blank page to be like i will now talk about why, um, you know, talk, talk about some microaggressions I've had in my life. Nothing, none of this would have come out. So I needed that kind of, you know, the axolotl. I needed these plants and animals to kind of help me talk a little bit, of, you know, about, about my personal, I, I don't know how people just write straight out memoir. I always bow down to them. I feel like, um, you know, as a poet, I always have this persona, the, the persona of each poem, the speaker of each poem. And this was the hardest book I've ever had to write. And I was so grateful when I was like, oh, I, I get to have, use an animal here or, you know, let's switch over from me and let's look, out, look at this other thing. But as you point out, so many of these animals and plants are um, interwoven with my own stories. Um, I can't not I can't separate them now, you know, um, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, but, but I need to write to write to generate that stuff. What came first, do you think the. Um the knowledge that you finally found a vehicle in which you could talk about things like microaggressions or, or represent yourself as an existing body, or this maybe pre-writing connection with animals as these guides to help you tell stories about yourself to yourself? Mm, that's such a good question. You know, I, um, I think, well, you know, when I first came up with this proposal, it was a very different book. It had like maybe 10% of me was ever going to show up you know it was i really wanted yeah. it to be just like kind of almost like a poetic encyclopedia um and for better or worse i included i think it was um the very first one actually i see stephen church is in here um one essay that was published with the normal school called fireflies um i put that in the proposal which if i didn't want to write about myself i shouldn't have included one that featured my mother in it and <laughs> Um, every editor was like, uh, come back to me. And so it was roundly rejected, but then they were like, come back to me when you put yourself in it. And then um, I, I was like, dang it. I yeah. didn't like, cause that wasn't, that wasn't my, my plan at all. And I, I just was like, well, I guess I had a nice idea, move on to something else. But I, I kept coming back, kept coming back. Um, and the only way I could, I, I found I could write about myself was still by asking questions. So I say like in poems, I always start with an image and with essays, I always, ha I just had questions. So huh. questions sometimes about my life, what I've observed, questions about the animal, but I always started with questions. And I'm pretty old fashioned. I start, I mean, I write everything with pencil. I still write with like blank notebooks and stuff like that. Um, so when I'm looking at the early, early drafts of this, they all started it's hard to say. I don't have one set thing like, let me ponder this about the axolotl smile or let me ponder this about my life. It was kind of both, but it was always in the form of a question. And that that's that's for you is the distinction between your process as a, a poet with four or five books and and an essay. Your This is your first essay collection. Yeah. Yeah. My MFA was actually um, a dual MFA in poetry and nonfiction, but I just poetry was kind of 
I don't want to say easier, but it just came a little natural naturally. I had some early success with that. Um, so, but my thesis, um, I mean, I loved writing it. It's just I kind of went away for. I mean, I would write essays here and there, but um, never had a project before this. Mm -hmm. So yeah, but that was that was when I knew also too that I just needed. I could not take the line break anymore. I didn't want I, to me. It just felt like another tyranny that I had to, another rule I had to listen to ah. in that space. Uh, and it was around 2016, frankly, the election, you know, and I just, I did not want to listen to any more rules and poetry. And I just felt like I can, you know, I could breathe in both genres, but I felt like I could exhale in mm. the essay. So, um, and I don't know if I necessarily answered the questions that I had, but it, mm. it came closer I know that I came closer than I ever would have been able to in a poem. That's amazing. I love that A, as a, a dyed in the wool essayist, uh, mm -hmm. a dyed in the beaver hat essayist. <laughs> I hope I don't die in this beaver hat. No. Um, I, I love the idea of the essay as your wild west space. Yeah. <laughs> and I also like it as the space for this kind of like actually asking a question and then the making of something doesn't necessarily include the answer, it's just the extended asking. I mean, mm -hmm. if you were gonna give me like an ideal way of thinking about the genre to which I have devoted my life, uh, mm -hmm. um, I would be very satisfied if if that was the way that people perceived it, um, rather than, oh, this is where personal material is, or, oh, this is where you argue a point, but mm -hmm. where, you, where you entertain a question and you are allowed a kind of wildness that's yeah. like, dependent on whatever project. That's exactly it. That's so beautiful. Can you, can you like, a, I want to make you like our essay evangelist. Oh. You know? <laughs> oh my gosh. You know, I think I need a, I think I need a little more time on that. Um, but you know, but it is, it's so, um, it's funny because depending on who you ask, I, you know, I saw something the other, I don't know, it was months ago. What is time? I don't know what time is anymore, but maybe it was last week. I feel like it was a couple months ago when someone's like, um it was it was a poet i i don't remember but i felt like it was snarky maybe they didn't mean to be snarky but i took it personally and um i sound like michael jordan have you been watching this thing i know about it yeah it's a, there's a lot of shade <laughs> <laughs> yeah i don't want to sound like michael jordan saying this i took it personally um but but it did i felt like there was some shade saying like um all these poets writing essays I'm good with writing poems, you know, and, and stuff like that. And it was just, but it was more of, I don't know, I, that's not exactly how it, how, what they said, because there was more to it, but it was just basically like, wow, state, you know, all these people are, don't know their lane, you know, and stuff. And I just, I'm like, what? We're in the middle of a pandemic and of all the things to bitch about, <laughs> all the things to bitch about in our country is genre like who gets to write in what genre like i mean anyway so just this whole policing of like who gets to write um essays who doesn't and um it, it just cracks me up because you know I, actually there's been several poems where people are like that's really prosy it's maybe a little too essay-ish and then and then to have um people be like i you know basically like i wish these poets would just start stay writing poems <laughs> um, <laughs> And who knows, they could be talking about somebody, something else entirely, but again, like the Michael Jordan, I took it personally. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think if you have a good reason, and it seems like maybe there's something about what what this book wants to do that is specific to maybe what the essay can do, which mm -hmm. I think is great. Um, and it's not just, I need, I, I wanna write sentences, it's there's, there's a there's a, a there's a, a way that these pieces work together when they're collected, and there's a, a, a the the starting mode is entirely different. That's yeah. yeah. Some, some poets don't even know that they are essayists. Like I'll get a book of poems sometimes, and I'll be like, um, you need to come over here and sleep under our tent because you're already in our sleeping bag. You know. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Do you? Oh, oh, I, I was going to ask you, Elena, because it's um. It's so thrilling. I, it's so rare that I get to talk with someone that is um, that I feel like just shares. I mean, we're very different writers, and yet we also have kind of very similar sensibilities too. Can I ask you um, a question that has been asked of me this whole fall? And I don't know if I've ever had a good answer, so I'm dying oh, to no. know what your answer is for this. Is just like um, 
the question of like why animals like why why can't you just write like the history of Elena Passarello you know like why what is it about animals that draws you to explore um them and then also kind of you know, it's never just animals. I know that, um, but what is it about animals that you that 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 brought you to animal strike curious poses? What is it about you know? Oh well, thank you for asking me a question at your party. But um... no, 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 this is none of that stuff. I, I this is I, I I just think of this as a celebration to get to chat with you. Are you, are you oh, kidding? Okay. Oh, okay. Well, in that case, it all started when I was born. <laughs> um, no, I think, you know, I think th I'll turn this around with a question to you, but I'll partially answer your question. I, 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 really, I think a collection, an essay collection is its own form. Yeah. It's a genre, right? Okay. A thing that, that you don't, I mean, because there's collected essays where someone publishes something in the Atlantic Monthly and publishes something in River Teeth. And then once they have 15 or 16 of them, they yeah. put them out. I love that genre. But then there's mm -hmm. also the I would like to write a series of essays that talk to each other in this way. Um, and that is my genre, mm. right? That is, oh, absolutely. rather than an essayist, I think that making a, making an album of essays, a mm. concept album of essays, is just sort of my, my jam. Yeah. And so then I just try and I have to find a subject that's big enough that I can sort of bounce off it of essay after essay, after essay, after essay, and feel like I won't get, I won't, I won't run out of steam. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Animals, I mean, I feel like it's one of those kind of top topics that like a lot of us will just re return to again and again and again because it's the way that so many people, not just in America, not just in the Western world, but globally are taught to speak, are taught to mm -hmm. visualize. The first art that we ever made as Homo sapiens was animals. Oh, um, Right. Oh my God! Yes. The character languages of about ninety yeah. percent of the world's existing languages. Most people think were inspired by the shapes either of animals or the tracks that they made in various pieces of earth. Mm -hmm. um, there's a million other examples of this. Um, the, the sounds that we make, the musical instruments that we put together, are just so intrinsic to our DNA. Um, it just felt to me like <laughs> I won't run out of ideas. <laughs> I mean, it is true. I mean, it, you're you're speaking to the choir here. You know, I always I get a little frustrated. The only time I really kind of get frustrated teaching is when people are like, oh, I don't know what to write about, and I'm just like, what? Mm -hmm. You know, I know I know that I never get bored in the animal world. I know you don't either. Um, but I guess it's, I guess too. I guess um, just to just to hear. It's just you you affirmed a lot of the things I've been thinking about. Um, in, in that I'm just simply cur endlessly curious about about the world, um, but in particular animals and, and, and plants, you know? And mm -hmm. I mean, even the title of your book, Strike Curious Poses, I mean, there's a curiosity there that's kind of winked at um, through the Prince title, but it's still, I, I mean, I can absolutely remember the first time I read yours in galleys, um, I wanted to look up so many things, you know? And so mm -hmm. that, that's like what the best writing I think about animals does is it makes me want to look up more and more and more stuff. Like the book is not as satisfying and as complete as it was. I just wanted to go off on my own and then explore and explore and explore. So um, it's it's so wonderful to hear hear you talk about this stuff on like why animals. I, I've never had a good answer except for I like it, you know, um, but I, I like yeah. hearing you say yeah. That's and that's that's another tenet of the essay. I like it is enough to get started. Yeah. And then if you can keep asking a question every time you start a new piece, then your project. I mean, and I know we have some essayists in I've seen them in the chat. Stephen Church, uh, total essay evangelist is here. Mm -hmm. Christina Propelko, my student from back in the day in Michigan. Um, let me ask you this, though. So, like, here's the question that I had when I set out to write a book about animals. And I do think I kind of ended up writing something else. Um, did your, and it sounds like you wanted to write a much more kind of third person-y book and mm -hmm. then um, the industry and maybe some other factors sort of changed it. Could you talk a little bit about how your project changed, not just because you the the, the interest was in this sort of more personal storytelling, but in, in the way that you discovered the book should be shaped or ordered or the language or anything like that? Yeah, you know, I just kind of like, um, 
so kind of the running joke that I feel sheepish about is that I read more science and nature books than I do any literature. And I read a lot of literature. I mean, I'm an English professor, so I, I read a lot, but I read probably double or triple just pure science and nature because I'm just a nerd. Um, Damn. <laughs> and, um, and it really kind of was, I was looking back up at my bookshelf. My bookshelves are in front of me, so that's why I'm looking up. But um, I was looking at my bookshelves and you know, Elena, it was simply, I was kind of just trying to mentally take note. And I don't know, like, it's not that I didn't notice it before, but again, it was right around 2016. Um, what I wasn't seeing on my shelves of the book, of the science books that I loved were by writers of color. And then I didn't see a whole lot of kind of mothering going on. I didn't see mm. a few mothers I saw, um, I mean, I can count on one hand, you know what I mean? And so I I don't know if there was ever one light bulb moment, but there was a moment where I think, and I don't want to give our president any credit whatsoever, but I will say that because of his um, xenophobia, because of the hate and fear that he was spreading even in his campaign, that actually empowered me in some ways, I can absolutely see it clearly now in ways that I maybe, I like to think that I would have come up to on my own, but it made me like hungry to to assert my family, my place in this world, all of my brown skin in this collection, even if nobody read it, but my like closest like 10 friends. It was just, I wanna put a daughter, a mother, a sister, a friend, a wife, um, who had brown skin and who just loved the planet. Mm -hmm. I, I, I just, I was, I was so emboldened by his xenophobia. It's like, oh, you think, you know, um, anything with brown skin or um, you think anybody, uh, gosh, I don't know, this is like maybe TMI, maybe it's too much, but like, you know, my, my parents are Republican. I want to say the good Republicans, um, not the, bonkers ones but um they're republican and um they don't support this president they never have um but like when 9 11 happened my parents were i think like in a walmart parking lot and someone threw like a, a can like a, a can of pop at my dad's head and the parking lot and so I'm like go back to your country and this is like the most you know he's a pretty republican he loves this country he's been in america longer than India, you know, now at now at this point. Um, and it's Florida. I like to say that was Florida man, you know, who right. did it. Hey, Florida man. Florida man. Ugh. Um like the Babadook. Oh. <laughs> exactly. So it's like stuff like that. There wasn't like one thing, but it just made me think like, gosh, when I was in grad school, I taught poetry to like kindergartners and, and up to second graders. And they all, not to get so cheesy, but they we're so, are so full of love and wonderment. There's not like a, there's not a shitty bone in their bodies, frankly. You know what I mean? They're so sweet. They're not like, they would never say, go back to your country. You know what I mean? Right. They learned the thing. Yeah. So it just made me, I don't know, all of this combined, all of these things, there's not one little moment, but just it had been building and building and building that I was like, all right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna at least try. I'm gonna. <laughs> try as an essayist. Hey. I know. What, what would a taco about the SAB without mentioning that little tidbit? Um, and yeah, so, so I decided to just go go with my whole heart. And again, I wasn't thinking of like, oh, this is, if anything, I was like, well, talking about, you know, being the daughter of a Filipino psychiatrist and Indian man, this is going to get me exactly zero eyeballs on my work, you know, like, and that was okay. It was actually freeing in some ways to know that I don't have any high expectations. I'm not thinking of this as like um, really anybody except my core like poet friends are gonna read this. And it was so freeing. And it, you know what? It felt so great to write my family's story on the page. And it's mm -hmm. still a fraction. It's still not, you know, the whole thing, but it felt so good to celebrate animals and plants along with my family. So, yeah. That makes me think of this kind of dilemma that um, maybe somebody will bring up in the q and I remember when I was doing Q&A for my book, a lot of people like to ask me about injecting the personal into conversations about species that are not our own and how 
there's this older, um, you know, kind of scientific adage that, you know, we are supposed to meet these animals away from, you know, because it's dangerous. It's dangerous to overly personify animals. But when you look at, uh, or any kind of natural landscape, you know, it doesn't have to be animals. It can be uh, fauna or flora or geography. But I think when you look at the way that those spaces, those naturalist spaces have been created uh, over the past hundred plus years of nature writing, you're a hundred percent right that nobody's talking about mothering in the concept of this life giving practice. And nobody, you know, we've, we've, we've learned time and time again from writers like you and Rahawa Haile and J. Drew Lantham that um, these spaces, which are supposed to be so protective of the realities of these animals are refusing the experiences of a significant portion of humans who want to write as well. Um, so I like that, I, I think it's important to, to note that maybe those kinds of pure science spaces mm -hmm. uh, aren't going to be able to address the way that the natural world needs to be for everyone. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that that's a great case for melding the personal with the scientific, right? Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much for saying that. And again, I'm, I'm very conscious too of like, I don't want this to be, I never want any of my writing to be like, oh, well, if you're a mother, you'd get it. Or, you know what I mean? Like, um, because uh, that was, that that kind, of, that kind of attitude drove me nuts when I was single and uh, and really <laughs> not having any kids whatsoever. So I definitely don't wanna be like, well, I was able to write like this because I'm a mother. No, I was, I've was i been writing like this since I was a grad student and absolutely yeah. certain I would not have kids, you know? Um, so, I, I want. I wanted to make that clear, and I know that's not what you were saying whatsoever. But it is. It is kind of just wild, like um, to have such a. And it's not because mothers aren't writing about it, or people with brown skin aren't writing about it. It's just that's on the publishing world. Yep. I mean, I'm not even like one of the first. It, it's just that's on the publishing world of what gets right and what gets overlooked and stuff like that. And it's. 2020 it's not 1955 so nope. um, there's a lot of good that's been happening it's it's so exciting but it's also i mean there's still a long way to to go you know um yeah, yeah well, anyway i think it's i think it's like uh i think it's proof that we need to expand our idea of what nature writing can do yeah uh, and i think most people agree um but uh i think nature writing needs to, you know stem needs to be steam right <laughs> science technology engineering and math there needs to be an a in there for art because this is a method of conservation Absolutely. right Absolutely. looking for the stories of our lives in the reality observed realities of other animals regardless of whether or not that might affect mm -hmm. uh, certain scientific realities of those animals is a method of sort of connecting us to these, like, and I remember there's this part in your book, Amy, where you said something that's really surprising that a class that you visited in a very firefly heavy suburb, 17 of the 22 students had never seen a firefly. Yeah. Yeah. And I wonder if maybe, you know, experiential connections will help encourage people to, to do the things that they're quite capable of, like going outside and watching, you know, just, I think just having that sense of wonderment or just having that the name for things so that you see like a patch of trees and you know that that's catalpa, not just trees, or mm -hmm. you know that there's a bird called an indigo bunting, not just random birds, you know, things like that. I think that helps us all. We see that in our own lives that once you get the name of something or once you have that experience, you'll want, you'll feel a little more tender to it. To it. It's not going to just be this... Um, casualty of, you know, like, oh, well, it's easy to put a parking lot there because those are just birds or just trees. But right. you know, to go bunting that looks up at the sky to navigate its way home, you know, that kind of thing. It may, I'm not saying it's going to solve everything, but it might make you pause before you clear a tree. And then my hope is that that tenderness that we feel towards animals and plants that we uh, because we get to know them or we get to experience them, hopefully that translates to humans, that we're, they're not just faceless brown people on the other side of the world that we can just bomb, you know, that kind of thing. They have names and they have hopes and dreams and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So it's really a way, it's never, none of this is said in the book, but my hope mm -hmm. is that people are feeling a little bit more tender 
towards plants mm -hmm. and animals. And then that way it makes them tender people mm -hmm. and towards other people, you know? Um, yeah, because all um, of the animals in your book are having an experience. And mm -hmm. the first step toward like, feeling less like like living outside of your own self is to imagine that other bodies other creatures other humans have experiences yeah yeah and i i was it was super purposeful of me um i i debated this but i it was purposeful of me to include things like a cassowary that i've never seen in person in fact actually this summer i was supposed to kind of have my first interview with one my um uh, at the atlanta zoo and oh. He passed away in July, like one more thing for 2020. Um, and he was the oldest cast. There's one more cassowary and it's in the San Diego Zoo, but who knows when I'll be able to see him. Um, but he passed away just kind of of old age in the Atlanta Zoo. Uh, but I wanted to include things that I had never seen before. Mm -hmm. um, in addition to kind of common things like the monarch butterfly to show that, you know, you don't, just because you don't, you haven't had a conversation with a person or you haven't, seeing a corpse flower doesn't mean you shouldn't care about it, you know, that you could read about it or hear about it or just listen to another person's story and then have some kind of empathy as well. So I know there's, some people, you know, I'm, I say that kind of proactively now because there's, our, you know, there's some people that are like, you know, ornithologists that are grumpy, like, well, you've never seen a cassowary in person. Why would you think you could write about this? And I'm like, what? Yeah. <laughs> when yeah. did will happen that you have to see or you know like be with a thing before you could write about it yeah um yeah boo um <laughs> i do um uh i want to bring up one fact that will hopefully entice everyone to buy amy's book uh when amy was a single lady um <laughs> she used the, <laughs> single lady, she used the corpse flower as like a dating litmus oh, gosh, can yeah. you tell us a little about that and then we'll go to our haiku competition yeah. and then Q&A. <laughs> I feel like anytime I say this, I feel like I need to um, defend my husband, the man I did end up marrying, you know, um, in that this was not his only positive trait, that there was, you know, hundreds upon hundreds, but this was one of them that made me um, fall for him. So it was not just this, you know, my husband's like, it makes it seem like the first guy who was interested in a corpse flower, you married him, you know. But in my book, you know, um, I do mention you could you could tell. I mean, people who are single and have been on dates um, know this that you could tell within five minutes, or I could anyway. Um, if this if a person sitting across from you at a bar or at a restaurant is even remotely interesting, if they have like other interests, like uh, if they read or if they're just curious about the planet. And surprisingly, that doesn't always like match up. Somebody, you know, again, I'm not saying anything new. Someone who's terrifically looking might just have nothing between his ears, you know. Um, um, and uh, anyway, I just, this was a way that um, if I just like mentioned, I don't know, the corpse flower in particular, usually I could see like a wince, like she's she's using three syllable words like inflorescent what what you know like um and you know that's when i can now like oh it's going to be an early night you know kind of like check you know that kind of thing and you know without giving too too much away um dustin um who's a, a wonderful essayist himself um not only was absolutely um enthralled by the corpse flower, but he took it upon himself to research them on his own and, and made like, kind of like, oh, we could visit this one in Indiana, we could drive this one he, you know, here and stuff like that. So that was not the only reason, that was just a reason. <laughs> uh, I, I, I can't wait to teach that essay on Valentine's Day, oh. right? Like you could write about love. There you go. In a way that involves research, yeah. that involves idiosyncrasy rather than, you know, platitudes. Um, but speaking of love, I love these haikus that are coming in and we are 50 oh, minutes in. So I want to have time if anybody has questions, but we should maybe do a little quick adjudication here. I see yeah, it. Let's see. Let's see. What is the, the first one that I have? Larry. From Larry. Let me see. Oh, okay. Great. great. All right. All right. I'm going to just, we're just going to do speed read, talk amongst yourselves, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. we're gonna... Everybody follow along in your hymnals. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and if there's something, you know, we, you know, if there's something I like, okay, definitely winner, definitely winner, you know, feel free, Elena, to chime in. I like this one from Larry. Here comes octopus. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, 
cephalopod shoes. Yeah, cephalopod <laughs> shoes. Yeah, that's exactly five at the Get end. Get it, Larry. All right, all right, all right. It's so great. I love it. Let me see. <gasps> Tori O'Hare. I love it. Look at that axolotl one. I want to read that one out loud. A hypothesis of axolotls. Maybe all ghost newts are just shards of the first one. Split off, healed, born. Oh my gosh, that's so good. How did you, you guys did this in like five minutes, 10 minutes? Not bad, Tor. Oh, the po too, I love it. Um, <laughs> echolocation, nice, nice for getting. Hey, Amanda, uh, let me see. Get that. <laughs> oh, I like I like this Putu one. In imitation, we name the bird for its whale. Pitcher mouth, Putu. <laughs> I love that. Chops. <laughs> that's, that's a good one. That might be in the running here. Oh my, there's so many good ones. Larry with another. Larry just went to town here with haiku. Junction, high flying pink petticoats waiting in the tank. Oh my gosh, I love Cheryl's. Look at, did you see Cheryl? Cheryl. <laughs> I think that might be the first time my last name was ever in a haiku. E passarella, e nizuka matato. There it goes. <laughs> I love it. I mean, that's the easy way to write a haiku is put our long ass <laughs> last names in there. Well done. <laughs> let me see. Let's see. The last one. Let me see by Monica. Oh, this is great. Um, Mo Monica's got cut off for me. Do you see it? Can you read the yes. rest of it, Elena? Okay. Uh, About Baby Owls by Monica. I begin with fireflies. Starlight, hunger for break, fast howl for milk in the dark. Ooh. I don't think I scanned it right. Uh. <laughs> oh, and then there's one more from Tori. Oh my goodness. Ooh. Corpse are boutonniere. I, and I, I can only do the first two lines. Okay. Can you a lily, accursed, vexed from weddings, only flies to call its love songs. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, this is so, this is tough. Do you have any like, and I mean, they're all like rising to the top here. What do you do? The Lindy Hop on two left frog legs. I love that. The um, the jumping, for the dancing frog one. I feel like you have a dog named Haiku, so you're really the only voice that matters. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's true. My dog's name is Haiku. <laughs> I'm leaning towards this hypothesis of axolotls, but I could. Let's do a winner and a runner up and I will buy a copy of World of Wonders oh for the Are you sure? Hell yeah. That's so nice. All right, well, so why don't. Gosh, these are so good. You guys, how did we, how did all these I know. experts come through here? <laughs> you guys, did you, like all of the haiku bards <laughs> of the country were like, Free book, and then they like logged on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, man, you know, I think I might have to go with the corpse flower boutonniere or the, mm -hmm. the axolotl one. Okay, so definitely Tori O'Hare, our champ. Congratulations. <laughs> I said, oh, God. <laughs> All right. Woo. All right, let's go with the winner, the axolotl one, and then you pick the, the runner up, Elena. I will pick the Putu. Because oh, it's got an exclamation point in it, and it was written by a giraffe, which is my favorite uh, quadruped, non-cat variety quadruped. So. Oh, fantastic, fantastic. Yeah, that, I love that, that Poti one. Good, good. All right, good. So um, let me see, Tori, and then who is the person who wrote the camera? I'm just going to mail it to those giraffes at the Portland Zoo. I mean, I'm assuming <laughs> that's who wrote those hackers. <laughs> giraffe, get in touch with uh, Point mm -hmm. Reyes Books. Call the number and then when the phone go, I am giraffe, and then we'll uh, mail the book to you. <laughs> Giraffe's hopes are going to be like, I can't dial on these hopes. <laughs> and Tori, same thing. Tori, if you get in touch, send an email to Point Reyes, um, we'll get you all hooked up. Oh, Kendra Green. Kendra Green is giraffe. All right, Kendra Green, you're going to love this book. Kendra has an amazing oh. book uh, about uh, animals and remembering them. And, oh, and so um, this she's she's definitely, she's fam. Oh, uh, good. Oh, I kind of was hoping it was an actual giraffe. She's, she's <laughs> as close as you can get, I think. Uh, 
So, okay. Well, congrats, Tori. Congrats, Kendra. Yay. Congrats to all of our wonderful haiku people. Um, please, like, uh, if you're on Twitter, tweet your haiku. If you're on Facebook, Facebook yeah. your haiku. Tag Point Raise Books. Tag me. Um, I would love to yeah. show the world what great work you did. Um, all right. So let's see. Maybe just a little bit of time. I don't want to go over. Uh, would anybody like to ask a question of wonderful Amy about her book, about her writing process, about how you make a fantastic uh, jellyfish hat? Uh, this could become a sewing conversation. And it could be it could be questions for Elena too. Like I'm, I've been talking basically since August nonstop about this book, and I love it uh, with all my heart. But I I am so here for for hearing Elena as well. So any well, questions? Let me ask you while people are typing, Amy, what are you going to do with your forced hibernation? What's the what's the plan? Mm, you know, so I'm taking um, well, I'm going to sleep and then I am one of the kind of insufferable. I love making and crafting things with my boys. So my Instagram feed has been like all like book, 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 book. Every once in a while, there'll be like roller skates, glitter, you know, yeah. but it's mainly been books. So it's going to be now, I think, just like more baking, crafting, and then that's kind of it for a while. Um, but I'm taking next semester off and you know, I don't wanna jinx it too much, but I'm reading, let's just say I'm reading a lot about snakes. So I, I'm not writing a book about snakes, I'm reading a lot of books about snakes right now to be continued. So we'll okay. I am a war, but I've I've outgrown it. I was gonna try to I have this like motorcycle jumpsuit like Britney Spears wears in the toxic video that's covered in snakes. Oh my god. But, um maybe we can have a conversation should we ever have an occasion to talk about snakes and I'll uh, run around the block a couple times and put on some spanks so I can squeeze into that thing. <laughs> Does anyone have a question? I have one I have one question that I will ask Amy um if no one else has one and then we can conclude. Um, but if you do have a question, now is the time. Mm -hmm. Just tell us a little bit, Amy, and, and we've got a lot of writers in the bunch. Um, what has it been like to, your book came out in August. Uh, what has it been like to put a book out in the pandemic? How did you strategize? What were the surprises? What were the heartaches? Yeah, you know, it's, um, oh, that's such a good question. Nobody has asked me that. All of, I think we're like- we didn't want you to quit. <laughs> But I know this is your last one, so it's okay. <laughs> but I wouldn't stop halfway through and just start weeping. You know, I will be totally honest. So when when everything was going down in March, uh, you know, slowly just like things were just like evaporating like soap bubbles, you know, um, like, oh, this event canceled, this event canceled. And I remember with such sweetness, there was a time where uh, me and the wonderful women from Milkweed were like, oh, August will be fine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's gonna stay in and we're gonna wear masks and we'll get the August will be fine. Like in fact, October will be more than fine. Um and so it's just yeah, so the the best image I have is just like um when you blow bubbles and they're so beautiful and iridescent and then they just start pop, 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 pop. So, so I will say this. Um and so this is nerdy and maybe this isn't cool to even admit it. I've never had a hardback book before. I've never like I'm a poet, you know, um, and all I wanted, and there was a time, honestly, too, that there was a moment I'd open my laptop, like, are we in martial law? <laughs> you know, like how honest, I was so worried. I mean, there was like so much death and destruction, you know, and also, frankly, there was times like I thought this country was going to burn, like it was on fire, but I thought the yeah. whole country was just going to burn down. So the last thing I was kind of thinking about in some ways was the book, honestly, um, because I just wanted everybody to be safe, not be shooting each other, you know? Um, and yet I I was working on this book for so many years, you know? Um, but I will say that it has been librarians, and booksellers who have been just the unsung heroes of the planet. Booksellers in particular have just, they are essential workers, you know? I mean, I think too, it's been amazing that people are home and yes, we're wallowing in our grief and sadness, but people are reading. People are really reading and having these Zoom sessions, I've never once complained about them because it's been a way for me to connect with people all over the world that um, in-person tours still wouldn't have. I mean, I-, mm -hmm. I I've I've been to I've been to London I've been to India I've been to the Philippines I've been 
to North Africa. Um, I've been to Mexico. I've been to South America, all from this little rainbow <laughs> corner of my room, you know? Um, so that has been so uplifting and so amazing. I mean, honestly, the bar for me was so low. I just wanted to hold a hardback book in my hand. And, you know, and I wanted to, I wanted this teal. I don't know if you guys can see this teal. Oh, yeah. Cover. I just, that has always been such a dream. Just That's like. Nekumata you know. teal, I believe, is the name of that color. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Oh, my gosh. I love it. Thank you. Thank you. All right, let me ask you just a couple of these questions. We have uh, we have more than I, I I didn't see the ask a question button. But here's a question from Sersha. Okay. Uh, Sersha would love to know about your audiobook reporting, recording process, what it was like. Did it change your relationship with the essays? And maybe can we piggyback with Karina's question about the visual art in the book? Mm -hmm. So you've got audio and visual. You've got these non-text-based components. Um, and how they changed the work that you were doing just in front of the computer for the many years that you were working on the project. Yeah, you know, so real quick, so I recorded the um, audiobook, um, the only place that was open, and this is shout out to my incredible, wonderful Methodist church. I, m I mentioned Methodist in, okay. uh, in there as well. That's what I tell the guy who would always be like, namaste every time he'd see me. I'd be like, I'm Methodist bitch. Um, <laughs> Anyway, excuse me, I hope my pastor's not watching, but the, I recorded this in the church. They were the only ones who had this, um, this amazing high-tech equipment. Um, mm -hmm. our, um, our tech guy, our music guy of the church, um, Cody Hickman was amazing. He came through, he knew, you know, um, uh, I, at the time I knew that I'd be having my um, older mother be living with us. She's living with us right now. So I just could not risk any um getting the rona or anything so they just like were so good about um masking up and you know we were we were on a table in one of the sanctuaries and it felt so beautiful and safe and there was something so magical about um doing that and having it be my voice you know i mean i um I was in college and high school speech and debate. So I was hoping that that Milkweed would let me and not hire another actor for it. It was important that it was, if not me, an Asian American reading it out loud. Um, but when Milkweed heard uh, me read a couple of pieces, they were like, yeah, you're reading it. So, uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's, I, the one thing I did notice is like, and I, and I read all my work, my poems, everything out loud. But one thing I really noticed, I think, when there was uh, Cody Hickman, the, the sound engineer in front of me, I write a long sentence. <laughs> and then, to, uh, so saying that a couple times, I mean, oh my gosh, he had so much patience. I'd be like, can I do that one more time again? Because I would have to take a deep breath. Um, mm -hmm. But I, that, that's me being exuberant on the page. That was me like typing faster than my brain can handle. So I didn't want to make these short staccato sentences. Mm -hmm. But it came, uh, yeah, I noticed that quite often when I was re reading this out loud. And then visually, um, we did not, you know, I have not met Boomi yet. Hopefully I'll be doing that um, this next uh, semester, but she basically, she got um, an early draft of the book and many of these have since been revised, but, um, and I gave her, if there was an animal in particular, like the pochi was one of them, um, where I was like, it is adamant to me that you capture, I'd make like a couple notes, like the eyes for the Potu were important for me. Um, yeah. There was a couple renditions of the Potu's eyes closed and that, no, we need those bright lemon yellow eyes. So I'd make a note, but she honestly, she did the research, she read this thoroughly and this is really kind of her, it was the best case scenario, I can't imagine. Where is she based? Is she in Minneapolis with Milkweed or? Um, uh, I found her on the web just from I have from her Instagram and her win her own website. So you're kidding. Like, yeah, like Milky has a great roster. Yes, look at that. I mean, she just was so and I and I'm sure I think she went through videos. So she went through an extensive kind of um you know, less a quick crash course in in these animal, these flora um and animals here as well. So yeah, anyway, it was just a dream come true. There was not a single like revision. Yeah. I mean, look at that. She just made even something like a firefly just be so magical. We also, you know, the designers of um, Milkweed Mary, Austin Speaker, wanted to call back to those books from the 70s that I was reading. You know, yeah. that spot color. Um, and uh, 
yeah anyway it was just it was just a dream Karina brings up a really interesting point, um, and maybe our last point uh, tonight, uh, which is that it feels sort of like a re retrospective ekphrasis. I <laughs> have to practice uh, that. Uh, there's like a like a, maybe an anticipation of the text, and then a reimagination of the of the image, and then a reimagination of the text through the image. Um, yeah, and I think that only works in the best like symbiotic relationships i mean i could not have because they would have been awkward right like i can't draw i can draw but not that well mm. if i would have felt awkward and weird to be like mm, i'm not quite sure you're getting the whale shark right or something you know i mean i i literally did not do that with a single one so it was it was as if she almost anticipated even my revisions because they uh, yeah it, it absolutely the art calls back to the text and i think the text calls back to the art in ways that are stunning, especially considering I literally have no idea what Fumi looks like. Like, <laughs> I, I adore her so much. So in, in some ways, I, I almost want to keep the mystery. We've never even spoken. We've, we've dialogued versus, you know, via DMs and, and texts and, um, and emails, but we've never met. And I almost want to keep that magic. Oh, um, that's uh, beautiful. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I literally have not heard a situation where that happens, where there was not even a single change. You know, there was not even a single change that I wanted to do. And Mary Austin, speaker from Milkweed, she just, um, she heard my initial pitch on how much, I mean, I think I was weeping after the election. Like, it is important to me that Asian women are in this book as much as possible. And, you know, she's a white girl from Minneapolis and she got it. She got it. I didn't have to explain myself. And so, it, especially in nonfiction, it just meant the world to me that I was not having to explain why or you know anything anything like that they just got it um anyway so it it's been it's been such a dream and it could have been an apocalyptic disaster releasing a book in this time but it is to and i should also mention this is an indie press by the way you know um and we have these two cast use my language um my marketing director yana and um uh, my publicity director claire and me on you know on instagram and it feels like goliath and, and david and goliath some days you know but they've just been i wouldn't change it for anything they have mm -hmm. just been amazing um yeah. at, at really speaking out for the indie presses and um and forever change working with them and the visibility that this book has received deservedly um has yeah. been pronounced i mean it's it's up there on all the lists and uh I hear about it on the radio. I see it on the internet. You know, it's yeah. following me around on Audible. Like it keeps Audible keeps recommending it to me, and I'm like, Audible, oh, I know this book, all right. But um, that's a real. That's not. That's not something that's readily available to a small press, and it takes a really savvy team to make something like that happen, as well as independent booksellers yeah. like our best friends at Point Reyes. So, Point Reyes um, so amazing. They met. I met them in January, and they were behind this 100. percent So. I just, it's really, it's changed me as a, um, not only as a writer, but as a consumer. Like I will shank anybody, you know, um, like, you know, I, I would buy the occasional Amazon thing, seeing what indie booksellers have done for this book and not just this book, what they're doing during a pandemic for everybody is, is, um, is nothing short of heroic to me. I mean, indie booksellers have kept people who've been, um, teaching their kids at home, who've been um, teaching college students, you know, um, from home. They have been um, the most reliable, some of the most reliable people that we've had, that I've interacted with all pandemic long. So you know. I will not forget this ever. And we should let these independent booksellers get to bed. Yeah. Uh, so Amy, what a delight to speak with you. I'm so happy that you've had the tour that you've had, and I'm also happy that it's over for you. And then you get to lay down your jellyfish head and do whatever you need. Oh, and there's Emily. Hi, Emily. Yes, yes, Emily. I just wanted to, to thank you both and kind of close out tonight, but I, I won't interrupt if you're still. No, 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 I was just going to thank you. I mean, there's, I mean, really, when this when this came up, when, when I got the email from Stephen, this is just, this was a dream to end it with you. And I remember when I, when I first read this book um, myself, I was like crying, laughing. I mean, it was just so moving. So. I never would have thought fast forward that we would be in a pandemic, that we'd be wearing animal hats and <laughs> talking about this on something called Zoom. I don't think I even knew what Zoom was then, you know, when I, um, 
anyway, so yes, uh, thank you so much, Point Reyes, for and Emily for um, and Stephen um, for hosting us both. We are two big cornballs, but you can see we love animals, we love writing, and we love independent bookstores. Thank you guys so much. And I will just say again, in case anyone missed it, the green buy the book button down here. And for one lucky person, if you buy the book before midnight, Amy's also going to send you a copy of Alina's book. So uh, yeah, before we close out, make sure you, you click that. And uh, thank you guys so much. Have a good night. And it was, it was really lovely. All right. Thanks, Emily. Bye, Alina. Take care. Bye, guys. Take care.